Hi, my name is Elizabeth Moore, a Senior Research Officer at Voxar. Today I'm going to talk through two recently completed studies which examined the 2018 New South Wales sentencing reforms. I'd like to start by acknowledging the contribution of Neil Donnelly, who conducted the quantitative study, the one in purple at the top, and also my co-authors on the qualitative study. In September 2018, the New South Wales Crimes Sentencing Procedure Act was amended with the aim of maximising opportunities for offenders to be supervised and to engage in rehabilitation programs. In summary, the amending act abolished home detention orders, community service orders, good behaviour bonds and suspended sentences, replaced community service orders and good behaviour bonds with community correction orders and conditional release orders, and also made some changes to the structure of ICOs. For example, the amending act allows a sentencing court to determine for itself the appropriate conditions with respect to the particular offender. Previously, the court had no such discretion because the conditions of an ICO were mandatory and applied regardless of whether they were appropriate for the offender. The amending act also gives powers to community corrections officers to vary supervision and certain other conditions imposed at sentence by the court and also gives broader powers to the State Parole Authority with respect to dealing with breaches of ICOs. So the quantitative study that I'm going to discuss had two main research questions. Did the probability of receiving a community-based supervised order increase after the sentencing reforms commenced? And also, did the probability of receiving a short-term prison sentence decrease after the sentencing reforms commenced? In terms of the method, the data was split into two time periods, which are shown up on the slide, and data was sourced from Boxar's reoffending database, which contained information on all criminal court appearances finalised in New South Wales since 1994. A number of different analyses were conducted for matters finalised in the local court and matters finalised in the district or Supreme Court, and the research questions were considered separately for two offender subgroups. The study used multinomial logistic regression and controlled for a variety of sociodemographic offender and offence characteristics. On the next two slides, I'm going to present some of the results using unadjusted percentages. So this graph shows the percentage of offenders with a supervised community order in the local court increased from 14.6 to 22% after the reforms were introduced. This graph shows the percentage of offenders with a prison penalty of 12 months or less in the local court decreased from 5.2 to 4.4 after the reforms were introduced. While I'm not going to show you the graphs, the results were very similar for the District and Supreme Court. So in summary, the study found that supervised community orders increased and short-term prison sentences decreased. The findings were consistent for DV offenders and Aboriginal offenders in the local court. And the multinomial logistic regression showed that the findings were statistically significant. The increase in supervised orders and the decrease in short-term prison sentences remain statistically significant after controlling for the sociodemographic offender and offence characteristics. The study confirmed that the 2018 sentencing reforms successfully achieved their short-term aims but the longer term objective of reducing reoffending needs to be examined further once sufficient time has elapsed. All right, so moving on to the qualitative study, which aimed to assess judicial officers' level of understanding and competence in the new sentencing reforms and had four main research questions. What are the judicial officers' perceptions of the reforms? Do judicial officers feel there is more flexibility in sentencing decisions? Has the process of engaging a pre-sentence report for a community-based order improved? And are there any barriers to imposing the new community-based orders? So with the method, just briefly, the survey was undertaken by Boxer in partnership with the New South Wales Judicial Commission. The survey had the support of the Chief Magistrate and the Chief Judge who sent letters endorsing the survey. Boxer emailed the survey linked to all currently serving New South Wales Judicial Officers and the survey was hosted by the Judicial Commission on a custom-built platform. All the responses were anonymous and data collection took place in October for four weeks. The survey collected a total of 93 responses and responses were collected on a five-point scale with some space for additional free text. 
So in terms of the main results, overall the survey found the majority of judicial officers agreed that the reforms are operating as intended and were generally supportive. Over half agreed that the new community-based options provided more flexibility in sentencing decisions. The majority believe that the new penalty regime has increased the opportunity for offenders to serve community-based orders. And just under half agreed that the new penalty options have increased the opportunity for offenders to participate in rehabilitation programs. Despite this support, a few areas of concern were noted. A recurring theme from the survey was the frustrations held by the judiciary with the way in which supervision conditions are implemented in New South Wales. Supervision is a mandatory condition of an ICO and can be imposed on a CCO or CRO. Community corrections are responsible for supervising offenders on a community-based order and under the new arrangements are able to suspend supervision if an offender is assessed as low or medium risk of offending. While a number of judicial officers did recognise that suspension of supervision is necessary, some questioned the formulas used in the risk assessments and felt that often offenders are being incorrectly assessed as low risk when there was evidence before the court suggesting otherwise. Some respondents also felt that suspension of supervision is particularly problematic in the case of an ICO, as an offender who breaches an ICO is not required to return to the court, so it makes it difficult for the judicial officer to assess whether the order is effective in reducing reoffending and addressing community safety. The next prominent issue we found was with ICO offence exclusions. While the majority of judicial officers generally agreed with the exclusions, a notable minority disagreed, particularly for offences such as manslaughter, sexual offences and offences involving the discharge of a firearm. Judicial officers cited cases and examples involving these offences where the circumstances didn't warrant prison but the ICL offence exclusions precluded the use of a community-based option. Judicial officers expressed the need or the want for more flexibility and discretion rather than less. Next, around a third of judicial officers felt that there were insufficient services to impose a full range of conditions for community-based orders such as community service work and rehabilitation, and this was particularly prominent in regional or remote locations. And almost half of all judicial officers surveyed felt there are unique challenges in sentencing DV offenders to community-based orders. These challenges largely related to issues of victim safety and the living arrangements of the offender when trying to determine appropriate conditions for a community-based order. I'm going to finish up by describing some of the recommendations suggested by judicial officers in the survey to address the barriers. They felt there was a need to increase resources, particularly in rural locations, to manage a greater number of offenders in the community and deliver more rehabilitation programs. They wanted to be provided with feedback on levels of compliance with ICOs. They felt there was a need for greater clarification regarding the interpretation of the section relating to community safety. Some felt that it should be considered to repeal section 17D, which can create unnecessarily unnecessary delays in having to obtain a report on home detention only after first imposing a sentence of imprisonment. Some felt that there should be a reconsideration of the ICO offence exclusions uh, and some felt that the sentencing options for interstate offenders should be expanded as they're currently ineligible for an ICO as supervision cannot be provided if they do not reside in New South Wales. Thank you.